Ladies, gentlemen, and most importantly, students, welcome to Kristen School. My name is David Boardman, and I have the pleasure of being the senior school principal here. This evening promises to be incredibly special, both in the opportunity to listen to Dame Dr. Jane Goodall, and also to share some of the incredible work that the students from a range of school communities in and around Auckland are doing in areas around sustainability, peace, and global citizenship. To get this evening off to a start, I would like to invite the Christian Choir, Euphony, to perform a Waiata, and they will be accompanied by Mr. Nick Dewars. that was. Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto katoa. No mai, haere mai, ki ngā kura o Christian. Ko he kurangi te maunga, ko waiapu te awa, ko ngāti parau te iwi, ko harauta te waka. Ko kura wahine o Ururoto aho, ko Alyssa toku ingoa, ko Wilson toku ingoa whānau. Tinakoto ngā hoa, whanaunga, me ngā akunga mai i ngā kura o Tamaki Makaurau. Welcome students, friends, and family. My name is Alyssa Wilson. I am from Westlake Girls High School and it is my esteemed privilege to welcome you all here for such a special night at Kristen to share in the wonderful teachings of the awesome Dr. Jane Goodall. It takes a special kind of person to bring so many people here together, and I am truly warmed in my heart to see all of you here for sharing in such important issues. I hope you'll all enjoy it as much as I do, and thank you for making the trip. With that being said, no mai, hare mai, tinakoto, tinakoto, tinakoto katoa. Dr. Goodall, please allow me to also add my personal welcome to you here tonight. I can say that as a child of the 70s, the stories of your research and those of Jacques-Yves Cousteau, in a time when scientific research and field studies were still an exciting mixture of exploration, adventure, and science, was a catalyst for me to later following studies in biology later on in life. By the very fact of the sizable attendance here tonight, you have all heard of Dr. Goodall. 
and the incredible work she's undertaken in primatology and anthropology over the past decades. Many of you will know her from her over 55 year study of the social and family interactions of wild chimpanzees in the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania, which she first started in 1960. This along with other studies has firmly placed Dr. Goodall as the world authority on chimpanzee behavior. And I can think of very few scientific studies that have collected data over such a period of time. Jane's fascination in chimpanzees probably started at a young age, and possibly as a result of her father, who instead of buying her the traditional teddy bear, <laughs> presented her with a stuffed chimpanzee called Jubilee, a treasured item who I believe still takes pride of place in Jane's house today. Jane started work as a secretary for one of the world's foremost paleontologists, Louis Leakey who believed that the study of the great apes could provide crucial insights into the behavior of early hominids, a family of primates that includes humans, their ancestors, and now some of the great apes. This introduction led her to her early work in the Gombe Stream National Park, and later her PhD thesis on the behavior of free-living chimpanzees, for which she gained, well, which she gained, sorry, from Cambridge University in 1965. In 1977, Jane established the Jane Goodall Institute to support the Gombe research, and she is a global leader in the effort to protect chimpanzees and their habitats. Its global youth program, Roots and Shoots, began in 1991, growing from an initial 16 students in Tanzania to over 10,000 groups in over 100 countries today. Jane is incredibly active lending her voice and actions to a number of groups concerned with sustainability, biodiversity, the environment, and animal protection around the world. She presently spends around 300 days a year traveling and lending her support and voice to these causes. Jane has been honored around the world for her tireless work, being named Dame Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire in 2004, and a United Nations Messenger of Peace in 2002. She has also received the French Legion of Honor, the Medal of Tanzania, the Kyoto Prize, the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Sciences, the Gandhi King Award for Nonviolence, and the Prince of Asturias Award from Spain. This year, Time Magazine named Dr. Goodall as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. So it is now my great honor and privilege to introduce and hand over to Dame Dr. Jane Goodall. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction, and good evening to all of you. Thank you for the people who've made this evening possible. And I'm very happy to be here as a guest of this school, knowing what an amazing work they're doing in education, especially in environmental education. So, first of all, how on earth did I get to be doing what I'm doing? How on earth did a little girl born to a poor family in England back in 1934 get to receive all these, these prizes that you read out? You didn't need to do that. Um, but I, anyway. I, cut the, I cut the list short. Yeah, no, you did. did. <laughs> anyway, so I was born loving animals. My love of animals wasn't triggered by my father giving me the stuffed chimpanzee jubilee. And it, everybody believes it because it's out there on the internet. We can't get rid of it. Um, it, was, it. It was not jubilee that caused me to study the chimpanzees, but Louis Leakey. I wouldn't have dreamt of studying chimps. But anyway, the main thing is I was born loving animals. I had an amazing mother who supported this love of animals. And she didn't even get mad at me, although she was really scared when she took me for a holiday onto a farm. And I was lost, missing for four hours. She'd even called the police. 
and what I'd been doing was hiding in a hen house because I couldn't understand where the hole was where the egg came out of the chicken. <laughs> it was my first real experience of the fact that you need patience and curiosity to study animals. At any rate, I, when I was growing up, there was no TV. I was eight years old when I found the books about Dr. Doolittle. I learned from books. And then I saved up my few pennies, it was during the war, to buy little second-hand books. I found a bookshop. Most of the books came from the library. We couldn't afford new books. And when I was 10, I, I was just able to buy this little book, which I still have, and it was called Tarzan of the Apes. So I took it home and read it, and of course fell passionately in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. And what did Tarzan do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, of course, I knew there wasn't a Tarzan, but I was very jealous of Jane in the book. And that's when my dream began. I would grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. No, no dream of being a scientist back then. Girls simply didn't do that sort of thing. So I was good at school, although I preferred to be outside watching the birds and, and little insects and so on around my home. Left school at 18, should have gone to university based on my academic performance, but there wasn't enough money for it. And so I had to do a boring old secretarial course. I needed some money. And then finally came a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya. To get to Kenya, I had to leave London where you couldn't save money and go home and work as a waitress in a hotel around the corner. I don't know, four or five months, maybe even six months, because people weren't generous with money after the war. They didn't have it to be generous with. Finally, I, I was able to get out to uh, get enough to buy a return ticket and buy boat in those days. No planes going back and forth. That's how long I've lived on this planet. <laughs> first place I set foot in Africa was Cape Town. And at first it was beautiful and I loved it, but then there was this writing on the doors to the hotels and the seats in the parks. And I asked what it meant, it was in Afrikaans. It meant white people only. And suddenly I didn't like South Africa anymore. It was the height of the apartheid regime. So I was happy when the boat left, got to Kenya. That was better because Kenya was moving into independence. Stayed with my friend, heard about Louis Leakey. Um, went to see him at the, he was curator of the Natural History Museum. And guess what? Two days before I went to see him, his secretary suddenly quit. He needed a secretary, and there I was. You never know in life when something seems boring when it might come in useful. So there I was now in a world where there were people all around me who would answer all my questions about the mammals and the birds and the reptiles and the plants and the insects and everything. And I think Lewis was very impressed with how much I knew, because I'd read everything I could about African animals. And so that led to him offering me the opportunity of going to live with and learn from not just any animal, but the one most like us. So, of course, for the first four months, as some of you have read or watched the recent geographic documentary, Jane, the chimpanzees ran away from me. They'd never seen anything like me before, and they're very conservative. They don't like anything new. But finally, one chimpanzee, whom I named David Greybeards, had a beautiful white beard. So this is David, almost white beard. <laughs> and uh, I still couldn't get very close to him, maybe as close as the wall over there. But on this never-to-be-forgotten day, I saw him picking stems of grass and pushing them down into a termite mound and picking off the termites. I saw him break off a leafy twig, and to use that as a tool, he had to strip the leaves and the side twigs. So if you saw that today, it wouldn't be exciting at all. Back then it was, because science believed humans and only humans used and made tools. And so it was that observation that enabled Leakey to bring in the National Geographic Society, and they agreed not only to fund the research when my six months money ran out, but also to send a photographer and filmmaker, and that was Hugo Van Lauwick, 
whose footage, those of you who saw Jane, um, and it's on Netflix, by the way, but his amazing photography. He's the first photographer in history to have got an Emmy, that's the TV prize, uh, for his photography posthumously. So that was, I wish he'd been alive to receive it, but still. At any rate, with the geographic ensuring that I could continue with the research, I was able to relax and really get to know these chimpanzees as gradually, because David didn't run, the others must have realized I wasn't as frightening as they thought. And I got to know them as individuals. And there was a time when they were almost like part of my family. I knew their personalities. I watched the males competing for dominance, swaggering, hair bristling, shaking the fist, reminding me a lot of some human male politicians. And some males have a very, very strong drive to get to the top alpha position. I was always fascinated in the behavior of mothers and their growing families, the close bonds that develop between a mother and her infant, and then between the brothers and sisters, bonds that may last throughout life. And we find in chimp society, as human society, there are good and less good mothers, and the good ones are supportive just like my mother. And when we look back over the years, it's now nearly 60 years the study has carried on, then we see that the offspring of the supportive mothers do better. By and large, they do better. The males get a higher position in the hierarchy and probably sire more infants, and the <clears throat> females are better mothers. So also, how fascinating to see they were communicating with kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting on the back, begging for food with outstretched hand, swaggering, shaking the fist, and using tools in other ways than fishing for termites, using long sticks to fish vicious biting ants out of their underground nests, using crumpled up leaves to sop water out of a hollow in a tree that they can't reach with their lips. And now there are people studying chimps in other parts of Africa. And we know that there are different tool using behaviors in different parts of Africa. And we can call them cultures. If culture and one definition of human culture is behavior passed from one generation to the next through observation, imitation, and practice. And so in West Africa, they use rocks to hammer open hard shelled fruit even though the same fruits are present in Gombe, they, they don't do that. And there are so many examples like that. When I first mentioned the fact that chimpanzees probably had culture, it was way back in the 60s, and you should have seen the response of the scientist. How dared I say that a non-human might possibly have a culture? It was pushed, pushed aside, pushed under the carpet. But, you know, I went on studying the chimps and finding out more and more about them. It was a big shock when I found that, like us, they have a dark and brutal side. They're capable of even a kind of primitive war. They kill each other. And that's territorial defense or expansion, when the males in groups will chase, attack, and subject individuals from a neighboring community to these violent assaults which usually leave them dead or dying rather. But just as we also have a loving, compassionate, altruistic side, so do they. And you see when a mother dies and her infant is old enough to survive without her milk, which isn't until three years, then the older brother or sister may adopt them. But if there isn't an older brother or sister, they may be adopted by a completely unrelated individual, even a high-ranking male, who will then save the child's life. It was very clear there wasn't a sharp line between our behavior and theirs. But after I'd been in the field about two years, I got this letter from Louis Leakey telling me that in order to stand on my own two feet when he was no longer with us, I would have to get a degree and he said, there wasn't time for you to mess about with a BA. I've got you a place, as you said, in Cambridge University to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology was. I hadn't been to college. Um, it means behavior. At any rate, I was very nervous when I got to Cambridge. These professors who were all so erudite, 
Imagine how I felt when I was told, you shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. That's not scientific. You should have given them numbers. You can't talk about them having personality. You can't talk about them having minds capable of solving problems. And you certainly can't talk about them having emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, despair. But fortunately, when I was a child, I'd had a wonderful teacher. And he taught me that however erudite these professors were in this respect, they were absolutely and utterly wrong. And that teacher was my dog. <laughs> you can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a rabbit, a horse, a pig, a, a bird, and not know that of course we're not the only beings on the planet with personality, mind, and emotion. And finally, science has been forced to give up this reductionist way of thinking. And it's the chimps that helped that to happen because biologically they're so like us. They share 98.6% of our DNA and also the similarities in blood and immune system and anatomy of the brain. And then that coupled with the amazing psychological and behavioral similarities, science could no longer ignore this. And of course, Hugo's footage, his films, and his still photographs in the geographic documentaries and the magazines, there was tool using displayed before their eyes. They had to start believing this young girl, even before I got my PhD. So I went back to Gombe, and I built up a little research station, and they were the best days of my life when I could be out in the rainforest and understand how every species of plant and bird had a role to play in this amazing tapestry of life, everything interconnected. And even losing one small species could lead to a chain effect, which could end up in total ecosystem collapse. You can look it up, and there's many examples of that. They were the best days of my life. So why did I leave? I left because in 1986, I helped to put together a conference. Mainly it was to find out about variations in chimp behavior across Africa, because by then there were about seven different study sites. Uh, but we also had a session on conservation. And it was absolutely shocking to see that everywhere, forests were disappearing, chimpanzee numbers were dropping. The beginning of the bushmeat trade, that's the commercial hunting of wild animals for food the snares that were set by hunters. Chimpanzees could break them, but they couldn't undo the noose, so they would lose a hand or a foot. Human populations growing, moving into the forest, and because chimps are so like us, they could catch infectious diseases to which they had built up no resistance. And then finally, there was the killing of mothers to steal their infants for selling as pets or for entertainment, circus and so on overseas. And in those days, back in the early 80s, they were still being used in medical research. That was something else I learned at that conference. Our closest living relatives in five foot by five foot cages put there because scientists believed that they would be perfect as sort of super-sized guinea pigs to test vaccines and vaccines and cures for diseases that other animals less like us cannot be infected. So it, that began a long fight. There isn't time to talk about it now, but it ended three years ago in all the 400 chimpanzees from National Institutes of Health labs to be freed into sanctuaries. And the point was that when this team went around to examine all the experiments, in 18 months, they found that not one single experiment being done was either beneficial or potentially beneficial to human health. They're so like us, but they're not like us enough, which is why we have to start rethinking experiments on other animals, even less like us. Well, I went to that conference as a scientist. I left as an activist. I didn't make a decision. It's just something that happened rather like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, I always think. And I knew I had to do something, but I didn't know what to do. So I, well, yes, I went into the labs and saw with my own eyes so I could talk about it, but I needed to go to Africa. I needed to see with my own eyes what was going on. 
and I managed to get some money to visit seven different research sites. But not only did I learn about the problems faced by the chimpanzees, I also learned about the crippling poverty of so many people living in and around chimpanzee forests. And there was the lack of good health and education facilities and the degradation of the land as human populations grew and destroyed the forest, turning forest to woodland to scrub, sometimes to desert. And it came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park in 1960, when I began, it was part of a forest that stretched right across equatorial Africa. By 1990, it was a tiny island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills, people struggling to survive, too many for the land to support. And that's when it hit me, if we don't help these people, there's no way we can even try to save the chimpanzees. And so, the Jane Goodall Institute started a program called Take Care or Takari, which again, there's no time to go into, but you can look it up on the internet. Basically, a very holistic program started when a tiny group of local Tanzanians, handpicked, went into the villages and asked the people what they thought we could do to help. And one of the most, um, I think, important things that we did was to provide microcredit opportunities so that uh, women, mostly women, could take out tiny loans that you can't get from a normal bank and start their own environmentally sustainable projects and find scholarships to keep girls in school during and beyond puberty. It's been shown all over the world that as women get better educated, family size tends to drop. And we do workshops, and then the local people go around and talk to the villagers about family planning, which, by the way, is very well received. So that program is now in all the villages throughout all of chimpanzee habitats in Tanzania, where most of them live in village forest reserves and are not protected. But now the people understand protecting the forest isn't just to protect wildlife. It's their own future. They need the forest. We all need forest just as we need oceans for providing clean water and clean air. And so all these people have become our, our partners in conservation, and that same program is now in six other African countries, and everywhere the people are becoming our partners in conservation. And that's the only way it can work, if the people on the land, the people who own it, are involved and supporting what you're trying to do. Well, all of this, you know, I was traveling around, beginning my 300 days a year trek around the planet and talking about the plight of chimpanzees, learning about all the other awful things that we're doing to the planet, which I'm sure all of you know about, you know, the, the destruction of the forest, the destruction of the ocean, and about the reckless burning of fossil fuels, the carbon dioxide that forms part of these greenhouse gases that circle the globe and trap the heat of the sun that's leading to the change weather patterns, which is everywhere where I go around the world. And that's why I carry, carry cow with me, um, because it's as more and more people eat more and more meat around the world, so this is contributing greatly to climate change and environmental destruction. So never mind the fact that it's cruel. Uh, cows have their personalities. Cows, if, if allowed, form strong bonds with their offspring. But apart from that, all these billions of animals now in these horrendous factory farms, they have to be fed. Areas of environment are cleared to grow the grain masses of fossil fuel to get the grain to the animals, the animals to the abattoir, the meat to the table. And using huge amounts of water to change vegetable to animal protein, and water is getting increasingly scarce on this planet. And then finally, food goes in here, and gas comes out the other end. That's the process of digestion. And cows also belch, because they're ruminants. And that is methane gas, and that's an even more virulent gas in the, uh, in the greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. Well, all of these things, along with human population growth, 
are leading to climate change. And you all know about climate change. There were demonstrations, children marching on the streets. And changing climate is everywhere. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. Everywhere I go, weather patterns are different. Everywhere I go, people are telling me how the hurricanes are getting more frequent and worse. And so is the flooding, and so the droughts and the forest fires. And so, not surprising, as I'm traveling around the world, I'm meeting so many young people, mostly high school students and university and young people are out in the world, and they didn't seem to have much hope. And when I began talking to them, why do you feel this way? Well, you've harmed our future, and there's nothing we can do about it. So if you young people here believe that we have harmed your future, you couldn't be more right. There's a saying, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children, but we haven't been borrowing your future. We've been stealing your future, and we're still stealing it today. And how is it possible? I mean, we talked about the similarities between us and chimpanzees, but think of the differences. And to me, the main difference is, at some point in our evolution, we develop this ability to speak to each other with words, not just gestures and calls. And that means I can come and talk to you about things you've never seen in another country. And we can bring people together with different experience to discuss problems and try to solve them. And so, how is it possible that the most intellectual creature on the planet, look up at the moon next time you're out there and think, wow, we put people walking on the moon when I was a child, that was science fiction. So how is it possible we're destroying this planet? It's our only home. There are pictures of Mars now. We don't want to live there. And so I think there's been a disconnect between this clever brain and the human heart, love and compassion. And I think only when head and the heart work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. So when the young people said there's nothing they could do about it, that's where I think they were wrong because I think we have a window of time. We have to act soon. We have to act as hard as we can. But I believe there is a window of time. And if we all get together and we all do our bit, we can at least heal some of the scars we've inflicted and we can perhaps slow down climate change. And we must. We simply have no option. And that's for all you students. This is your future I'm talking about. So people are always saying to me, Dr. Jane, you've seen so much suffering going around the world, human suffering, the refugees, the migrants, the people living in abject poverty, the people suffering from diseases in Africa and other developing countries that we can cure over here, but there's no money to cure them there. And you've seen the destruction of the environment, the melting of the ice, the rising of the sea. So do you really have hope? Well, I've got, I've got four reasons for hope, maybe five. First of all, it's all the young people. And I started Roots and Shoots back in 1991 so that the young people could understand that there is time, they can make a difference, that every day, every one of us walks on this planet, we make some kind of impact. And we get to choose, we get to choose. Some people can't choose. If you're living in abject poverty, you just have to do what you can to get through the day. But we can choose what we buy, we can choose how we treat people, we can choose to plant a tree. We can make these choices. And so every single day that we live, we make some kind of difference. And Roots and Shoots began with 12 high school students in Tanzania. And they were concerned about all sorts of things around them, poaching in the national parks, illegal dynamite fishing that was destroying the coral reefs and the livelihood of the, of the other fishermen. They were worried about street children with no homes. They were worried about stray dogs. They were worried about all sorts of things. And so I told them to get their friends together, and we had a meeting. And from that meeting, February 91, Roots and Shoots was born. And right from the beginning, its main message, every single one of us matters. 
Every single one of us has some role to play, even if we don't know it yet, and every single one of us makes a difference every single day. We decided, because everything is interrelated, that each group between them would choose three projects to make this a better world, one to help people, one to help animals or other animals, because we're animals too, and one to help the environment. And so what began in, with 12 high school students is now in 60 countries. It's been in more, but you know, in some of the small countries, the leader leaves and perhaps the program collapses, but we've planted the seeds. And we know now that young people who've been through Roots and Shoots keep the values with them for the rest of their lives. And so it's now in these 60 countries there's all the people who've been through Roots and Shoots, and they're now beginning to take up high positions like ministers of the environment and teachers, and they're going into government. And they all share these values, values of respect, respect for other people. It doesn't matter what country. Respect for people with different colored skins, with different cultures, with different religions. Respect for the other animals with whom we share this planet. Respect for Mother Nature. And if we lose this respect, then I hate to think of the future of humanity. And we need it now more than ever before. So the, the Roots and Shoots groups, we think there's about 150,000 kindergarten, even a few preschool, university and everything in between, and even some adult groups. And you'll hear in a minute some of the projects being done by young people here in New Zealand. And I've been around in Wellington, and I will be going to Christchurch. And even just in New Zealand, I've been inspired by the energy and commitment of young people. First reason for hope. Second, this amazing brain. We're beginning to come up with technology to enable us to live in greater harmony with nature. And we are... We're, we're beginning to think about our own ecological footprints. Next reason for hope, the resilience of nature. Fly over Gombe today, you won't see those bare hills anymore. They're all green, the forest has come back. Here in New Zealand, there are so many places where we have once destroyed nature, but now with some help, nature has come back. Uh, Zealandia, I was there, it was destroyed by the gold mine gold mining, and now it's a beautiful forest filled with life and birds. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And here in New Zealand, you have so many examples. A little boy today gave me this kakapo. The kakapo was nearly extinct. And the black robin, look it up. It was down to two birds, one fertile male and female. And because of the work of Don Merton, there's now 500 or more. It's a beautiful story. Look it up. And the next reason for hope is, I suppose, social media, because we can gather people from all around the world by pressing a couple of buttons on our computers to bring them out, to raise their voices about an issue that they care passionately about. Involve people who perhaps felt a bit uh, lonely and isolated, but now realize they're part of a growing understanding of what we need to do to save the world for future generations. And finally, the indomitable human spirit and the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up. One of icon is Nelson Mandela, who helped to lead South Africa out of the evil regime of apartheid, which I encountered in 1960. But this is Mr. H, and some of you will have seen him. He's in so many pictures. It was given to me 29 years ago by a man called Gary Horn, who went blind at 21, decided to become a magician, was told it was impossible if you were blind. The children don't know he's blind, and at the end he'll tell them and say, things may go wrong in your life, because we never know, but if they do, don't give up. There's always a way forward. And he does scuba diving, he does skydiving, and he's actually taught himself to paint. Now, he's never seen Mr. H, but in fact, he thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee and I made him hold the tail. He said, never mind, take him with you and you know I'm with you in spirit. But 
Um, Mr. H has been with me now to 65 countries, and he's just one example of that indomitable spirit that enables us to do things that other people may say we can't. And do you know something? Every single one of us in this room, everybody, young, old, we all have that indomitable spirit. You have to recognize that you have it. You have to let it out into the world to help make the world a better place and never give up. And so that's the message I have for you. And I know that Roots and Shoots is growing here and all of you who join Roots and Shoots, and I hope after this visit, many more and other schools too will join this growing family that's spreading around the world. And it is a family and people go to a strange country, and they meet Roots and Shoots groups and they feel at home. So I encourage all of you to join Roots and Shoots to find out about it. But also remember you have this indomitable human spirit. And I didn't introduce these guys, but just quickly, Ratty demonstrates that rats are amazingly intelligent and these giant forest rats are detecting landmines buried deep under the ground because of their amazing sense of smell. And they're now detecting ivory and, and rhino horn and pangolin scales. And Piglet, well, Piglet, after this, Google, not Picasso the artist, but Pig Casso and just see what you will see. So thank you very much. And, uh... Thank you, Jane. As I mentioned before, Roots and Shoots has grown from small start, an initial 12 students back in 1991 to over 10,000 groups. And this is testament to the effort. 150,000 groups now. Oh. So the, the number of individuals must be incredible. Thank you. This really is testament to the effort you put into supporting this cause and also the importance of the messages that it communicates. And thank you so much for your messages of hope today. Thank you. This then is a fitting opportunity to share a special, me a special message with you, all from Jafet Jonas, one of the leaders of Roots and Shoots, currently in Tanzania. Hello, my name is Jafet Monangombe. I'm the Roots and Shoots National Coordinator in Tanzania. We are very happy today to hear that um, there's a, such a wonderful gathering today in New Zealand. Sarah and I have been friends for many years, and I know how much passion she has with the lives of young people. So the young people of New Zealand have this opportunity to connect together with the rest of the world to become the really change makers because Roots and Shoots is all about making positive things to happen. Our founder, Dr. Jenny Gudo, is giving us a message of hope so we can all connect together regardless how far we are. So welcome to the Roots and Shoots program and uh, be part of the fun. Thank you. Now, can I take the opportunity, please, to welcome the head prefects from Kristin, Swati Puri and Joshua Heatley, who will share with you the plans for the 2019 prefects project. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh, and this is Swati, and we're the head prefects of Kristin School. Every year, the prefect team undergo a prefect project, which is aimed to benefit a community in either inside or outside of the school through service. 
This year, we've decided to focus our project on making a lasting impact on our school and the wider community through the emphasis of, of environmental sustainability and awareness. Through discussing ideas between ourselves and the Prefect team, we wanted to divide the Prefect project under, into two parts. One aspect of our project is to build an outdoor seating space next to our newly created forest walk and garden area. This will hopefully act as a gateway for environmental awareness. In this day and age, we are all so heavily reliant on our devices. This space will have an amphitheater type seating plan, along with decking and tables for students to eat their lunch and just spend time with their friends. It will allow teachers to take their students and use it as an outdoor classroom on a nice sunny day. Therefore, the area will cause students at Kristen to escape their iPads, iPhones, and laptops and soak up the beautiful nature that we have here at campus. On top of that, we also have plans to renovate our neglected greenhouse and garden space. Not only will this improve um, the facility, but also create opportunities for learning about our environment in a practical way. We will be painting murals, providing homes for our turtles and new animals, and have plans to install solar panels to the greenhouse in hopes to introduce renewable energy to Kristen. Dr. Jane today planted kutukutuku trees, which are now rare in Auckland, though they were once abundant, and we have hopes to plant native species like this in our local waterway through our project. After completing these renovations, we will share our facilities with the wider community, continuing our relationship with Birkdale Primary, inviting them to experience our project. Right now, there was a huge movement in young people taking the lead and making a difference. This has inspired us to impact our community for the longevity of our beautiful planet. Dr. Jane, you often speak of how each individual matters and everything we do makes a difference. So we hope our project gives our community the tools to continue this mindset and take action. Our sustainability project is holistic and we hope it will follow the roots and shoots aims of helping people and the environment and animals all together because these systems are all interconnected and the importance of caring for each aspect is vital. We hope that through our efforts, we will spark future students to be more conscious about our environment. Thank you very much. So I would now like to invite Albany Senior High School onto the stage to talk about their amazing art exhibition that promotes peace. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Irina Chen, and this is Al James Campbell. We come from Albany Senior High School. We are Year 13 students, and tonight it is my absolute honor to share with you about our school project. But before that, I would like to take all of us back to 74 years ago. August the 6th, 1945, America dropped the world's first atomic bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The single explosion wiped out 90% of the city, the home to 280,000 civilians. Three days later, another bomb dropped on Nagasaki, killing an estimated 74,000 people. These two bombs are known as Little Man, Little Boy and Fat Man, who are two extremely atrocious men who brought complete destruction, despair, and they took families, lives, and hope away. Peace, what is it? Freedom, love each other, or would you say lying on a couch and with pajamas and watching TV? For me, it is not merely the absence of war, but rather the presence of a harmonious union. One individual cannot achieve such unity, but when two or more people gather together, making good cause, anything is possible, because like Dr. Jane Goodall once said, togetherness is strength. Last year, I participated in an art exhibition called To Monaco, which was organized by my classmates. I went there simply because I wanted to contribute a song for peace. Did not expect the exhibited artwork were so inspiring. What I saw then was not only ink and paints, but the dreams our young people shared and the hope they have. This year, together with several of my classmates, I am very fortunate and excited to run to Monaco. 
Tamanako, meaning hope in Māori. It's an art festival that carries the message of peace for the youth and by the youth. We commemorate the 74th anniversary of Hiroshima Day. We also support our Muslim community in Christchurch and celebrate New Zealand's 32nd anniversary as a nuclear-free country. We are hoping to spread the message of peace and we encourage all of the youth to take part in Tamanako. Your contribution can be in any forms of artwork. For more information, please come and see us at the foyer and join us to sow the seeds of hope. The opening ceremony will be held at AUT campus at 2 p.m. on 4th of August. There will be children's artwork and lovely performances with messages of peace. We also give thanks to all those who help us support the, this meaningful event. Lastly, as Dr. Daisaku once said, peace is not something removed from our daily lives. And remember, as powerful as nuclear weapon can be, what's more powerful? Us. Norera. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Albany Senior High School. I'd now like to invite Lucas Armstrong from Age to share about their projects to protect Takabuna Beach. Hello, I'm Lucas from a year 10 from Age, where we dare to dream. Ants are very industrious team workers. They work tirelessly cleaning up mess. Imagine if we worked as hard clearing up after ourselves. Perhaps we are so busy in our everyday lives, focusing on other things, that convenience takes precedence. In this hurly-burly world, we do not even consider the need to protect our oceans and their assorted life forms. So how can the children of today positively affect change? Acting with purpose is our driving focus and force at age. Our learning centre has been observing how our urban community is affecting our beaches. Through extensive research, our tribes discovered that it is a vicious spiral, snowballing way out of control. So take some time to consider what life could look like below water in 50 years' time. From what you see, how does it make you feel? Now, take off the rose-colored glasses, because at the rate we're going, there will not be any life below water. If you join the plastic bags found in our oceans around the world and tied them end to end, they would circumnavigate the globe 4,200 times. Water covers 75% of our Earth, and we are not protecting our oceans. We need to come together and make a united stand, and our time is running out. We consistently work as guardians of Takapuna, removing litter from our community and endeavouring to keep it out of our waterways. It's the cigarette butts that are the most tiring to remove. People seem to think that these minuscule specks of paper are not litter and refuse to dispose of them appropriately. Our quest to keep Takapuna Beach litter free is driven by our discovery of the gem nudibranch Dendrodorus gemacea, an endangered species, the Microzonia volutina, an endemic seaweed, and the encrusting orange sponge, Hymeniacidon prolibus. These research findings are exceptionally good until you consider that if it weren't for humans, these beautiful creatures would bloom everywhere. So how many of these extraordinary beings will have to die if the world does not make a change? Plastic poison is polluting our shorelines daily. So there are many things we can all do. If you make helping our Earth one of your priorities and uh, purposes or priorities, instead of setting it on the back burner, it will do a great amount for everybody involved. So I challenge you, the audience, to listen to the natural world and be more like ants. If you can choose to be more like ants, share this with each other tonight and choose not to applaud. Let's show everyone that silence can be deafening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas, for sharing your passion for protecting Takapuna Beach. 
I would now like to invite Diocesan Girls, uh, School for Girls onto the stage to talk about their project with helping communities in Fiji. Welcome everybody, my name is Chloe Hicken. And I'm Tanushri Sharma. And today we will be introducing you to our current and future projects. Firstly, I'd like to start by introducing you to our current project, which is the Fiji Service Trip. This is an ongoing project that's been part of DIO for over 25 years. Every two years, 20 students and staff volunteer in Fiji for two weeks at either the Wainaloka Village or more recently, the Wailuku Village. Every time the trip is carried out, there is a certain project that the girls carry out in the villages that has been decided with the village elders before they go over. We have used Dr. Jane Goodall's compassionate leadership trait of thinking critically to develop this service so that we give in a way that is not paternalistic, but rather gives the Melanesian people the agency to decide what they need and so that we give in a way that best benefits the people who are the central focus of our project. In the past, this has meant that we have built playgrounds, basketball courts and rugby fields to be used by the village kids. To us, it is really important to think critically so that we reduce our impact on the environment as well as giving in a way that does actually benefit the people. To reduce our impact on the environment, we have um, come up with ways to reduce carbon miles on the materials and tools. We source local timber from Fiji that has been sustainably farmed and we always think about how we can cut out plastic as well as not taking over anything that cannot be reused in Fiji. This part of the project focuses on people, as we believe that when you focus on people and give them the help that they might need or want, then they can give to the environment and the animals and help them. Our future project has developed our focus to include more of enhancing the environment and animals whilst also helping people. So as Chloe and I were reflecting on the service trip, we realized that the total transport released approximately 0.336 tons of carbon emissions per person. By thinking critically about what we could do to help offset this um, and help the animals and people, we came up with the Planting for People project. In this project, Chloe and I, along with numerous other volunteers, will help plant native trees um, such as the Five Finger, Fuchsia, Karamu, and Kofi. The five finger is especially attractive to whiteheads and silver eye. Um, the kororo, though not an endangered species, are still considered to be nationally vulnerable. They play a significant part in the distribution of native trees with large seeds, which in turn feed other birds, hence are critical to the New Zealand environment. These birds are attracted to berry-bearing plants. Therefore, by researching and careful considerations, we decided it would be best suitable to include the karamu tree when performing this project. This project not only helps to protect and cherish New Zealand's unique natural heritage, but help improve the lives of people. As many studies show that spending time around trees or even looking at them lowers blood pressure, reduces stress, and improves mood. So hey, there we have more reasons to love trees. The compassionate leader's trait of thinking critically enabled us to come up with a solution which helped to benefit everyone. Through these two projects, we aim to provide our services to help make a positive and truly worthwhile impact on the native species, the people, and the environment. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed. Thank you. I would now like to invite Westlake Girls High School onto the stage to share the community projects that promote global citizenship. Kia ora. Considered to be the world's foremost expert on chimpanzees, thanks to her 55-year study of social and family interactions. She was also named UN Messenger of Peace and is a global beacon of hope, just to name a few, as we've already heard. Um, I would also like to say that we have a little in common with Dr. Jane, as incredible as she is. Although we didn't get to work with chimpanzees ourselves, we did get to work with individuals just as cheeky and playful. Young children. At our school, we aim to emphasize intergenerational global citizenship through social projects. 
We hope to educate the next generation on values they should encompass to benefit tomorrow's world. For our project, Starting Young, Lily and I wanted to create something that would be self-sustaining and would have a long-lasting impact on our society into the future. We're aware of the poor state of our environment and when interviewing primary school children, we found they were often unaware of the issues our world faces. We decided to create hand-drawn picture books, plastic jellies about plastic pollution and litter bug about appropriate, using the appropriate bins. The books are aimed to be relevant to the kids using specific place names like Rangatotu Island and the Horiki Gulf. This helps them to understand the issues that are apparent in our society and our community, therefore we'll feel more inclined to change. For the books to stand out on the shelf, we knew they had to be different, so we decided to integrate augmented reality into the pages so when kids scan them, they come to life. To pair with it, we also created a virtual world Last year, we visited Takapuna Primary, a school in our local community of learning, Puki Kahui Akor, and we showed them how to use the books, augmented reality, and read them to them so they can enjoy them in the future. For our project, we carried out an activity day where we held a number of different interactive activities for kindergarten students to get involved in. These included colouring in, cahoots and similar activities. Through, through these activities, we educated the children about ethical consumerism, specifically poaching of rhinos and elephants, endanger, endangered species, and how to protect them. We have received great feedback from the kindergarten teacher. In fact, she said it was one of the best trips the kindergarten has done. So working with three to four year olds was a little different to the age range that we're normally used to and thus some improvisations had to be made to cater for that. So one example of this was we were holding a drawing activity and the kids were quite you know, nervous and hesitant to get involved. So I did what any person would do, I got down on my hands and knees and pretended to be a lion. But we found that the kids were nowhere near as hesitant. In fact, they got on their own hands and knees and followed me around, as you would when someone pretends to be a lion. It was awesome, and I found that immediately the environment changed, and we were both so much more engaged and had so much more fun. Funnily enough, this was a key moment for me in understanding what it meant to be a compassionate leader. Through putting myself out there, being open and collaborating in a way that may make me look different, I was able to engage and teach the kids more than what I was through the drawing activity. Overall, the projects we carried out promoted intergenerational global citizenship and encouraged young children to care about the environment and its species. We have specifically chosen to target our projects at the younger generation as soon they will be the consumers and the leaders of our future. It is essential that they are compassionate, educated and working towards being good global citizens because considering the state of our planet right, right now, we can no longer sit back and let the adults take charge. Change must start with us. And we as a group decided to educate the younger students as they can help better the environment and take action to make a difference in our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Westlake Girls. I would now like to invite De La Salle College onto the stage to share their Our Stream, Our Taonga restoration project. Good evening. At De La Salle College, we have a creek running through the school grounds. One of the small creeks around Mangere East that feed into the Otsaki Creek. The land around the creek used to be bare field with scattered invasive species of trees. When the rain runoff from the dirt field would enter the creek as would litter and leaves. You could smell the creek across the school as rubbish was traveling downstream, bringing scrap wood, tires, insulation material, and dump bags of trash. You could hardly see the bottom of the creek with all this muck and out of control creek weed, let alone any fish trying to make the creek their home. Humans destroyed this creek, and it would continue on this path of destruction unless we changed. 
Our Environmental Council formed in 2015 with a small group of students taking charge of the school creek. We started off small, pulling out building debris, tires, and a bike from the creek, moving into weeding the creek banks. In science, we learned about how the creek would look or was cleaned up. With tree planting being the key to prevent soil runoff into the creek with their roots, their leaves boosting oxygen levels, storing carbon and bringing shade to the creek, and bringing birds to feed on flowers and fruits. We needed to work together to create this change. With just under one kilometer of land needed to be cleaned, dug up, and planted, not easy for 12 and 13 year olds. Teamwork has been key. In 2019, and four and a half years later, our creek environment looks extremely different. The land on either side of the creek was cleared of invasive weeds and trees with around 100 students and staff, and external helpers planting approximately 3,500 native trees from Trees That Count and Project Crimson. Plants such as Manuka, Toi Toi, Tuatara, and Rimu were planted over these four years. We have monitored oxygen levels, pH, water clarity for sediment and fish, and invertebrate levels in the water. Initially assisted by Andrew Jinks at YCARE, now done by us in the Enviro Council. The runoff now is barely there, with clean water in the creek Tuna and Inana making the creek their home. Tui and fantails fly throughout the trees. The trees planted in 2015 are now well over three meters high, with clearing and planting happening yearly to maintain the creek banks and fill in any gaps. We have changed part of our community. One of four key values at De La Salle College is service in our community. Service to help those that can't help themselves, to protect our taonga, our treasured resources. It started with learning about the positive impacts we could have, to act with purpose. Then as an Enviro Council, working together to clean up our creek and plant all 3,500 trees, we learned the best rhythm to dig the proper way to break the root ball, helping others with hard soil to finish the planting days, supporting each other, helping each other pull out rubbish from the creek, swapping digging with planting when we were tired. We then had the help of Waikia, Trees That Count, Project Crimson, and teachers on our journey. Our creek is healing, and we'll continue to help with other parts of Auckland with tree planting as part of Auckland Council and Million Meters. We couldn't have changed the creek as quickly if we worked alone. And with more to do, we'll be there to help our community. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and showing us how important a long-term commitment is. I would now like to introduce our final school for the evening, Whangaparawa, to the stage to bring in another important concept of sustainability, this social enterprise project. Good evening. My name is Kyle, this is Tiana, and this is Kyla. And just a short while ago, Whangaparawa College has undertaken a new way of learning, project-based learning. Our school decided to choose a select group of students to test out this new way of learning. We also had to apply to be chosen. We had to either submit a video, a speech, or an email. We all made the most of this opportunity and worked really hard to create some truly amazing projects. Each student, each student in its class uses self-directed learning to create an individual project that reflects their passions in life. We have taken this as a perfect chance to actually start and make a difference and prioritize this greatly by focusing our projects on ideas that we hope will make a difference in our community for the environment. Today I have been fortunate enough to have been chosen to present my project. In term one, I came up with the idea of designing and selling a product that helps the environment in some way. I have always been into graphic design as well as business studies and zoology. These things are very important to me and are a huge part of my project. Within the first two weeks of term, I had created a small company called Wild Cotton. Wild Cotton is a place where products are designed and used to raise awareness for the endangered species. I designed several pairs of socks that each featured different animals on each of them. They, all had, they were all hand-drawn by myself using Procreate on my iPad Pro. I created a website and a social media account to help put the word out about my product. 
I also created a survey that I asked people to fill out and select their favorite design so that I could manufacture the winning one. The winning design was the hawksbill turtle, which is critically endangered. Without this turtle, our coral reefs and seagrass beds would suffer. They are a fundamental link to the marine ecosystem. By the end of term one, I had started a company, created a website, a social media account, and sold 40 pairs of socks, which enabled me to then look into how I could package my product to maximize the impact my message would have. I decided to pre present my socks in an eco-friendly eco cardboard box. I included a pamphlet with information about the Hawksbill turtle, and I also printed stickers with my drawing design of the turtle that is also shown on my socks. I thought this could be used to put on people's phones, books, and laptops to, make, to help keep the turtle in people's minds and also put the thoughts continuously raising awareness. Kyla felt it was important for some of the money raised to go towards a sustainable charity. This also helped with marketing the products and people were happy to pay a little extra if money was being put towards helping these animals. Kyla donated 25% of her profits to a charity chosen by herself, the World Wildlife Fund. Now imagine Kyla's project on a much bigger scale. Global corporations using 100% recyclable materials, providing huge amounts of environmentally safe and reusable well-priced items, paying thousands of employees and giving back to the people. McDonald's using only biodegradable materials. Clothing producers using recycled cotton and unnecessary paper usage being the thing of the past, being a thing of the past. Our world could be a very different place. Thank you very much for listening and have a good night. Wow, what an amazing group of people that we have. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and inspiring us. It is sometimes important to know that young people can make a difference every day. It's great to show that we can carry Dr. Jane's vision into the future. So can we please have a round of applause to thank all the schools involved. You can learn more about these projects in the displays out in the foyer. We also have Hobson and Hobsonville Point Secondary School and Linfield College also here tonight to share their youth-led projects making a positive impact. So definitely check them out on your way out. Thank you. Dr. Jane, please accept both my thanks and the thanks of everyone here tonight for giving up some of your valuable time and visiting us here at Criston. Your message is, as always, one that is incredibly poignant and on a topic that not only affects those here tonight, but their children and grandchildren too. I would now like to invite Dr. Goodall to leave the stage and visit our foyer to see the displays from the schools. I would ask the audience at this time just to remain seated, please. Thank you again. <laughs> 